There are two ways in which any government can proceed. One is a way based on what you and I would call a free society, which is enshrined right at the heart of the American Constitution. The other one is a way which allows only one view, both of economics and politics, in which almost everything is either owned or controlled by the state, including the uh, media, including the ideas, including freedom of discussion and everything. There is no freedom of discussion. Now, between those two ways, the free society and the totally controlled society, there are, of course, variations. I think what we've learned in Britain is that we've gradually, over the last certainly 12 or 13 years, with perhaps a little interruption, gone slowly further and further away from the free society towards something else. <coughs> At the same time, we've found, I don't find it strange, but some other people do, that we have stopped creating wealth. We've had a large number of increasing restrictions. And you've been finding two things. First, that we are more and more concentrating on redistributing the wealth we've got rather than creating any more. To create more, you need a slightly freer society and you need an incentive society. Naturally, when I see that happening, I look with very great alarm to societies which have gone even further left. That is, they've tried to redistribute even more and haven't had the incentives for people working hard on their own account, doing well for their families, and often then being able to create jobs for others, they've produced a much more prosperous society than we have. But by and large, you've got the two broad, different economic and political approaches. And I think in many ways, American politics have been, well, they are very different because you've two parties based on a free society, mm -hmm. or free enterprise society and economic freedom. We have one party based on that, one main party, and another one based on socialism. But you see, for years now in British politics, this word, you must use it, consensus, has reared its head. You must have a consensus. Uh, it's, a, it's a word, again, you used not to use when I first came in politics. We had convictions. And we tried to persuade people that our convictions were the right ones. And it's no other good having convictions unless you have the will to translate those convictions into action. But politics was <coughs> more, if you had convictions, than a matter of multiple maneuverings to get through the problems of the day. I often think when you're going for consensus, so often it means that those who believe as I believe tend to give in to the left wing and you steadily move further what and further left. What is it that uh, ultimately transforms experience into guidance? Uh, I, give you, uh, I give you a recent example. It's conviction from and determination. W Will well, it's, it's also, uh, it's surely it's a hierarchy of values, isn't it? Because uh, if, uh, if by experience you find that uh, you lose a certain amount of liberty yes. in return for a precarious security, yes, you and, decide and you what don't, matters and you don't to mind, you. then you yeah. don't yeah. You call it a hierarchy of values. I say what matters to you. But and yeah. if I lose liberty, then it takes away the basic reason for living. So what is if you're the sort of person who doesn't mind about having any liberty provided you've got a house and food coming to you and you will do what you're told to do, mm -hmm. uh, then perhaps you won't mind. I suppose it's the difference between being born free and living life like an animal at the zoo in a cage. Yeah. All right, um, some animals do live lives in cages. Um, but, I mean, for me, freedom yeah, most, is part of life. It's vote. all... <laughs> well, so, so we, we, I only use it. that as an example to show that the, the difference between you can have total security without any freedom. Sure, sure. But now the, I, I was about to, to some you, people, was, that would be attractive. Not to me at all. I, I was about to give you an example uh, of something recently written by an eminent professor of economics called George Stigler, the University of Chicago. And he said, you know, there... there there are a few things that economists know with the force of certitude. Uh, there are a huge number of things about which we are very vain that we don't know at all. But certain things we do know. And uh, one of them, for instance, is that minimum wages will not raise the level of income. Now, he said, any further demonstration of this is entirely supererogatory. It's just known. However, 
neither the Republican Party in America nor the Democratic Party would ever dare to come out in opposition to the minimum wage because the superstition is endemic that the, su that the minimum wage actually elevates the income of, a, of poorer people. In fact, poorer people are precisely who are hurt by a minimum income. Make the now, point about minimum income. I think in societies where there are enormous differences between very great wealth and very great poverty, I would recoil from that. You recoil from what? From enormous differences between very great wealth in the presence of very great poverty. That, that has no, 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 no. Yes, but it has. One moment. What? You wait. I'm coming to okay. that. So there is therefore something to be said for a certain amount of redistribution there from by taxation, and you've done it as well as we have. This is what taxation is about. So you do do a certain amount of redistribution from those. Well, I, yes, I know you're getting very irritated, but just wait one moment. <laughs> Uh, from those uh, to, to try to help people who are poverty stricken to get up off the floor and raise their standard. And we would call that, that not a minimum wage, yeah. we would call that a basic safety net. And we would accept a moral commitment in a kind of society like yours or ours that jointly we do try to guarantee some basic standard of life and indeed um, uh, rather more than a basic standard of life. But there are certain um, benefits you can get from Social Security, and we both agree on that. Now, what has happened to us is that the redistribution process has gone on so much further that the standards here, say in earnings, are our lowest income earners earn about half average earnings, and our top in net take-home pay our top income earners only times. earn about four times. So that's a, a comparatively narrow gap. As a matter of fact, it happens to be narrow, isn't it, in Soviet Russia. Now, once you compress the incentives from the top down and say, it doesn't matter how much you earn, I'm going to take the lion's share away from you, then they say, all right, I'm no longer going to do the lion's part. And then they stop creating the extra wealth which would both benefit them and benefit society as a whole. Once they stop doing that, they don't benefit, <coughs> then there aren't any extra taxes to improve the schools or the social services. Now, do you see there is some point in some societies in a degree of redistribution, but once it becomes a depression on incentive to get on by your own effort, then you're denying all people the means of increasing the wealth of our people individually and as a whole. Sure. And you, 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 you just become, as we have become, you're making a the stagnant point. That's right. society. You're making